Well, here we are again, and we're still in the book of Proverbs, still in verse 7 of chapter 1, and we're doing an overview uh, in the book of Proverbs. Uh, we're looking at 15 different verses that give us an idea, an understanding of uh, what it means to fear the Lord. Now, in the last session, I believe we went through seven of them, and now we're going to try to get those last seven in before we go on to verse 8 of chapter 1. Um, let us go to Proverbs 15 let's see Proverbs 15 16 but before we go there let's pray father there are so many wonderful verses here so many great truths please help us to proclaim them to expound them and please help the young people who are listening to uh, to understand their content to apply it and to see that this is truly the way of life that there is a so many good things in the keeping of your commands and lastly father and most importantly i pray that the young people will see that even in spite of the greatness of these commands nothing is greater more wonderful than your gospel, than your son who died for us and rose again from the dead. And I pray, dear God, that these children would not so much be enamored by principles, but that they would see Christ and believing in him have eternal life. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, Proverbs fifteen sixteen. It says, better is a little fear, it, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. You know, I, uh, I've heard about these reality TV shows, you know, where they um, bring a camera into the home or the mansion of, of wealthy people. And, and you see that they have so many things and so many supposed opportunities and they're famous and they know famous people and... Their life is full of, of glamour and excitement and also superficiality and turmoil and conflict and selfishness and so many other things that, that carry with them a horrible penalty. It says here, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure. Now we've already seen and we will see over and over again that the wisdom of God is greater than any treasure. Now, here I want you to recognize that it's not saying that it's, uh, it's wonderful, that you're godly if you're, if you're poor and you live in poverty. That's not what it's teaching. It's not what the Bible teaches. Um, the Bible is not against even a material prosperity. It is against um, luxury sensuality, extravagance, but it's not against living a noble life. It's not against having the appearance, because, it, because the appearance is true, having an appearance of, of the blessing of God. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, when you come to my home, it's not, it's not a luxurious home, but it's a strong home. It's a strong house. It's, it's built well. Uh, the yard is cut. I want things to um, appear orderly and clean, safe, secure. I want someone to look at every aspect of my life, whether it's, it's my clothing or my car or my home or, or anything else in NC. There is a soundness there. There's a healthiness there. There's an order there. Okay? So God is not saying that you are very, very spiritual if you live in sackcloth and lay in ashes and you uh, mourn all the time and you're half starved to death. No, the, the Bible teaches us that there is a blessing and there is a prosperity, but it, it's a prosperity in the context of, of someone who loves the Lord, is living for eternity, loves their brothers and sisters in Christ, Someone who is generous and kind and self-giving, you see. 
there's always a balance. And in the same way that there's always balance, there's always people who go to extremes. Whether it's the TV preacher talking about prosperity and jets and cars and mansions, or it's the other person who's believing that they're so spiritual because they, they only get their clothes at Goodwill and um, they only eat rice and beans. And, and neither of those things um, represents the balanced life of Scripture. Now, there may be times when we have to go through great suffering. There are very godly people who have spent many years, John Bunyan in prison, others who have suffered poverty in the book of Hebrews. But as a normal case, um, people should not see luxury or extravagance in us at all, or sensuality, but they should see a wholesomeness, a nobility, a security, a cleanness, uh, an ordered life. Now, but he says it is, it is better to have just a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. And that is so true, particularly with regard to relationships. To have turmoil between a, a husband and a, a, a wife, to have turmoil between parents and children, to have turmoil between siblings is a terrible thing. But if all are fearing the Lord, you will see that turmoil come to an end. Now, it doesn't mean there won't be problems because we're people and we're not perfect. But, but listen, if, if I walk around my family just giving everybody what they deserve, there's going to be turmoil. And if they're giving me what I deserve, it's going to be turmoil. But if I act in a way that is ordered by God's commands and I obey him because I fear him, then there's going to be far more stability. You know, someone in my family may not always deserve me being patient. And so if I live that way, I'll have an excuse not to be patient because that child has gotten on my nerves. But if, if I live this way, if I recognize that God has commanded me to be patient and to not be patient is sin and to demonstrate a lack of fear of the Lord, then things are going to change. There's going to be greater... Um, it's going to be more constant in my family if we're all living not primarily for each other, but we're living for God and the honor of God according to his scriptures. That is going to remove a lot of turmoil. Now, let's go on. Proverbs fifteen thirty three: The fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom, and before honor comes humility. Do you want to be wise? Do you want to be wise? Well, wisdom starts with humility. In what aspect? Recognizing you're not wise and that God is wise. You esteem him, you reverence him, and you bow the knee to learn from him. And you put yourself in the scriptures, which is his book, and you learn to be wise. So you've humbled yourself before the Lord and he's honored you with wisdom. And you become an honorable and wise man or woman. So this, this whole thing here comes together. The fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom. Humble yourself, fear God, learn from Him. And then it says, before honor comes humility. And that's always the case. Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will raise you up. Humble yourself before His Word, and He will instruct you. The honor of wisdom, the honor of a virtuous life, the honor of integrity, it comes from the Lord. And so what is the first step? Humble yourself before him. Recognize that you need him. Recognize that you need his wisdom. And he will raise you up. He will help you. That's why in the, in the scriptures he's often called our helper. Because he is. Now let's go on. Um, verse uh, Proverbs 16, verse 6. By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. Now, this is a difficult text to interpret. But the great majority of scholars would look at it this way. We have sinned. And our sin must be atoned for. Now, let me explain this to you, young people, and listen. The great problem in the Bible is 
How can a good God, a just God, a holy God, pardon the sin of wicked men and still be holy and just and good? I mean, if a criminal stands before the judge and the judge just lets him go free, that judge is morally corrupt. He's not a good judge. He's not righteous. He's not holy. He's not even fair. Do you see that? So how can God simply pardon us? We say because he's loving. Yeah, but there's a problem. His love cannot contradict his righteousness. He is loving and righteous, and he has to exercise both of those things. So the answer is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through God's loving kindness, he has sent his son. And his son lived the perfect life we cannot, have not lived. And his son went to the cross. And on that cross, all the demands of God's justice that he had against us, all the penalties, all the punishment we deserved, it fell upon the son. The son was our willing substitute. And justice poured out its justice on the son. And when the son said, it is finished, it was paid in full. So through the loving kindness and truth of God, our iniquity, our sin has been atoned for. It's been paid for. But now look at what our response should be. And by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. You know this thing about, you know, let us sin that grace abounds. You know, some people will say, well, you know, we're saved by grace, not by works. So let's just live in sin. A person who says that type of thing has not been saved by grace. You see, to be to recognize you're a sinner. Guilty, condemned and hopeless and to know that God gave his own son for you. To believe that will bring about some very serious changes. You'll realize that you cannot save yourself by pleasing him. But by trusting in Christ, you know you're saved. But knowing what Christ did for you will make you want to live a pleasing life. Now that won't always happen, and it'll never happen perfectly. But the whole direction of your life begins to change when you recognize what God did for you on Calvary. It begins to change, student, child. Listen to me. You live in appreciation of that. And you show that appreciation by what? By the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. I want to keep away from this evil. Why? Because I reverence God. Why? Because he sent his son to die for me. This evil here that I'm being tempted to do was the very evil for which Christ died. Do you see? So if we are saved purely by the grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has done a work in us and there's going to be a change of the heart and we are going to want to reverence God and we are going to be sad when we do not. And I, I'm saying that from the scriptures, but I'm also saying it from experience. Young person, listen to me. I have been serving the Lord for many years and I've preached in many places and done many things. The best moment of my life would only earn me hell. Um, as a preacher, I hope to be sincere, but I, I'm, I have nothing but Christ. It's not 99% Jesus and 1% me. It's 100% Jesus. He's done it all. And that's why we boast in him and salvation is trusting in him. I hope you see that. Now, um, Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord leads to life. It talks about life. It, it's not just talking about uh, many years, a quantity of life. It's talking about a quality of life. You know, there are many people who live many, many years and they regret all of them because their life has no quality to it. Jesus Christ came to bring us life. And that life is defined by knowing God, communion with God. And living in the blessing of God. So the fear of the Lord leads to life. Truly does. And then look what it says. So that one may sleep satisfied. Um, the word literally is sleep full. Content. 
content. You know, if if the world, this world, is all that we have, I don't see how anyone could ever be content. Because there's so many people out there that have so much more than we do. And if this world is all we we get, then we need to go out there and get as much as we can. But if we're waiting for a kingdom whose maker and builder is God, then regardless of our lot in life, um, you know, whether you're a missionary sleeping on a straw mat in Africa or you're a extremely wealthy businessman who is also a godly Christian, the satisfaction doesn't come from what you are or what you are not, but it comes from your relationship with God. That's how you know peace, is fearing the Lord, believing in His Son, knowing that you belong to Him, that's what allows you to go to bed at night, satisfied or full. Now, he says, untouched by evil. Now, we've gone through this. We're going to go through it again. Uh, it doesn't mean that someone cannot break into our home and do us great damage. It doesn't mean that a godly missionary will never be martyred or beat up or suffer. That's not what it means. But it does tell us that the evil one will not touch us. It does tell us that not even death that nothing in this life and nothing in death can take us out of the hand of the all-sovereign God. And we rest in Him. You see, here's the thing. Uh, if tomorrow morning I wake up and every army in the world is out in my front yard. Now, my yard's not that very big. Not that big, but let's say that they were all out there with all signs saying, in five minutes, we're coming in and we're taking you out. You know... They do have the strength to do that, don't they? I mean, one guy probably standing in my front yard could do that. But I know this. They can't touch me unless it's ordained by God. And if it's ordained by God, it's for my good. Do you see that? You see, here's what I want you to see. Um, all these blessings of life, temporal blessings, they're, they're not wrong and they're not bad. I, I, I want you to enjoy life, but I want you to see something. Um, the greatest blessing is that you have eternal life, that no one can snatch you out of Christ's hand or the Father's hand, and that neither life nor death nor powers nor principalities, nothing can separate you from the love of God, and that God's good for you is not necessarily temporal. It's eternal. It's so much higher than temporal. It's eternal that you be conformed to the image of Christ. And he's going to do whatever is necessary. And the things that are necessary for me to be conformed to the image of Christ are not necessarily necessary for you. And so, untouched in a way that no one will be able to ever separate us from the love of God. Now let's go on. I've got to get through these. Proverbs 22.4 the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Now, again, we don't need to go back and explain this. But in a general way, when you look at those who walk in humility and who fear the Lord, their life is full. And this, this thing of riches, honor, and life was kind of a, a Hebrew way of talking about a full life. And we know that riches aren't sinful. Honor's not sinful, and life is most certainly not sinful. But we know people who have riches and honor and life, and their life is not full at all. So that can't be his meaning. His meaning is that in whatever station of life you're in, there'll be a sense of fullness and a wonderful world, a word that so few people ever grasp, contentment, to be content in the Lord and with his will for your life because you know that he loves you. And you know that he has a plan for you. And you know that one day he'll take you home uh, to glory. Now let's go on. Proverbs 23, 17. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Uh, especially for a young person. It is so easy to look out there at, you know, maybe famous actors and athletes and, and different people that, that maybe, not all of them are, but, but some that are, are quite ungodly, and yet it seems that the world has been laid at their feet. 
And there's a temptation to want to be like them. Don't make that foolish mistake. Don't. What does it matter, Jesus said, if someone gains the whole world and loses their soul? And never realize this, this whole world lies in the power of the evil one. It doesn't mean that he has more sovereignty of God or that they're equal and they fight against each other. But in its rebellion and sin, it's been turned over to some degree to Satan's subservient rule. And he can give it to whomever he desires. So be very, very careful. People who inherit the earth in this life oftentimes have inherited nothing. Satan will dangle these things in front of your face in order to draw you into a trap. Now, uh, many of you, like I said, I'm teaching this to like 12 year olds above and below, but um, I'm 58 and you know what's amazing? I have lived long enough to see people that were my age, let's say I was uh, 18, famous athletes who were 18, 20, you know, famous actors, famous singers, famous people who, who at, when I was young, I looked at them and I said, man, this isn't fair. I mean, you know, I'm driving a beat up old car and this, this guy owns the world. He has jet planes and he has this and that and everybody loves him and he's famous and all these things. I've lived long enough to see what happens to them later. Not in every case. Not, not everyone has a destroyed life. But what I'm saying is by and large, remember, the old man sitting on a bench looking and saying, by and large, I've seen people who were very, very beautiful, but now they're old and ugly. I've seen people who were very powerful and now they're very weak. I have seen people very, very rich who are now very, very poor. I have seen people who you would envy them for their strength and now they're dead. I've lived long enough. The Bible is true, whether I affirm it with my experience or not, but I can tell you this, I've lived long enough to see it's true. I have seen people gain the world and lose it. But on top of that, also lose their soul. Now, don't do that. Very, very foolish. Now, we got to keep going on. Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear the Lord and the King. Do not associate with those who are given to change. Listen, we've talked about fear of the Lord, but let's talk about fear of the King. <sighs> Kings are imperfect. Presidents are imperfect. And, and kingdoms, um, they rise and they fall. One king will come who is righteous and do much good. Another will come behind him and in a, just a stroke of a pen destroy all the good that he's done and turn the nation back to evil. And, and so, yes, we, we, don't, we don't live for this kingdom. We don't live for earthly kings. But in another sense, we've become a people who are very vulgar, very common and rude and we don't seem to have a sense of of honor for anything and we've been taught uh, to to anyone who has authority to dishonor them and and that's not true we need to be wise we need to be discerning we need we never need to entrust ourselves wholly to to any man any person any authority yet at the same time the bible teaches us give honor to to those whom honor is due you know, when a president I agree with um, arises, I call him President So-and-So. And when um, a president arises that I don't agree with, I still will call him President and use his name. I will seek to give honor. Also with regard to your parents. No, your parents aren't perfect. No, yes, they're going to make a lot of mistakes. Yes, they're going to have to come to you sometimes and ask for forgiveness. That's true. But don't ever get into an attitude of you despise authority just because it's authority. Because that is a quick way to death. Don't do it. Be discerning. Be wise. But don't be one of these vulgar, common people who simply are... They scoff at everything and they mistrust everything because you'll, you'll dry up that way, just become bitter, and it's wrong. All right, um, it says, do not associate with those who are given to change. And this is something that we need to be very careful about in our own character. You know, um, uh, how's Paul today? Well, it, what day of the week is it? It should never be that way. We shouldn't be like the wind. 
We shouldn't be like the sea, ever changing in our character, in our, our attitudes, in our personality. It demonstrates immaturity. It, demonstra it demonstrates um, a sinfulness. Again, there are attributes that pertain to God alone. And yet we are to seek to uh, reflect the image of God. And one of those great attributes of God is he's immutable. You're always going to get the same God. He does not change. So what he told, told the people in, Mal in Malachi, he said, the only reason you're not destroyed is because I don't change. I'm faithful to my promises, my covenants. And, and so be very careful of yourself. If you see that you're always changing, then recognize your need to grow. Get in the scriptures. Get discipled. Go to your father, your mother, your pastor. Ask for help. Grow. It's not a good trait to be ever changing. It also makes it very difficult to be in relationships because no one knows what they're getting. What's he like today or tomorrow or in this circumstance or that circumstance? We, we need to seek to be constant. And it is difficult. It's difficult for me. But we need to grow. Now, also, those people who are given to change, it makes it very difficult to trust in them. One day they're hot for God. Another day they're cold. Another day they're lukewarm. One day they seem to be overly religious and legalistic. The next day they seem to be antinomian. That means against the law or living as though there was no law of God given. Be very careful. In your friendships, look for stability. Don't, don't look for perfection or I won't be your friend. But look for some sort of stability with regard to their walk with God. Because all instability demonstrates immaturity and lack of conformity to Christ. Now, the last one, um, and you're going to think, oh, this is for the girls. Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. I don't know how long it's going to take us to get to Proverbs 31 to talk about the godly woman, but um, how many of you guys out there have read that? You say, I'm not reading that. That's for women. No, actually it was written for a son in order to discern who is a, a godly woman, who is a woman to whom you want to commit your life. And charm is deceitful. I mean, uh, the devil, I imagine, could be quite charming. Maybe he was very charming in the garden. But charm can be very, very deceitful. People can pretend. They can know how to act, how to move your emotions. Beauty is vain. Now, there's nothing wrong with being beautiful. I, I wish I was more beautiful, I guess. Um, there's nothing wrong with beauty. I, I remember one time uh, I was in a church and, and two ladies in the church were singing. And um, they were very, very good singers. And they loved the Lord. And, and they were very, very beautiful. And I remember afterwards this guy came up and he said, you shouldn't have beautiful women up there like that singing. And I said, well, were they immodest? He said, no. I said, were they uh, dressed in a bad way? No. Did they sing something wrong? Was their attitude sensual? No. And I said, friend, I, I think you've revealed more about yourself than you've revealed about these ladies. It's not a crime for them to be beautiful, you see. So there's nothing wrong with beauty. But know this, there's something greater because beauty doesn't last. It really doesn't last um, a long time, physical beauty anyways. Um, a woman who fears the Lord, she will be praised. She will. And I can tell you this, guys. You can marry a beautiful woman. If she doesn't fear the Lord, it will be like living in a prison. It really will. Now let's turn this around. Um, chivalry is deceitful. And a handsome, being handsome with a lot of muscles is vain, ladies. Um, or a man who seems to be a great, you know, wealthy. All of that is not the standard by which we judge the character of a man in the same way that we don't judge the character of a woman by charm and beauty. But the great quality you're looking for is this person fears the Lord. You see, if my wife lives, responds to me only according to what I deserve, well, I don't always deserve the best. Um, I have my own problems. And so is she going to change in the way she treats me based upon my 
actions. Is that what she's going to do? Um, that would make her response to me like this. It would lead to great turmoil. But if she says, look, I'm married to this man, and God has given me certain commands to obey, regardless of whether he's worthy or not, then her attitude and her actions toward me are going to be a lot more stable. In the same way, if I look at my wife or my children and say, I'm, I'm going to act toward them according to what I think they deserve or how they acted today, then again, my behavior toward them is going to be very unstable. But if I sit there and I think, no, God has given me commands regardless of regarding how I should act, regardless of what they do. Do you see how much stability that adds to a relationship? So the fear of the Lord is very theological, but it is also extremely practical. Now, the guys here at the office told me, do not go beyond 20 minutes, but I've gone 31, so forgive me. But I hope this has been helpful. And in our next uh, session, we'll come back and, and we will start uh, verse 8. So until then, study the scriptures, pray, walk with God, enjoy God, commune with Him, and love your brothers and sisters in Christ, and love those who are not in Christ, honor your parents, and uh, most of all, trust in Christ, because all those other things do not matter unless you have faith saving faith in him.